The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Bartholomew. Um, uh, welcome to Anatomy of an Open Source Release. Uh, I work for a company called Monty Program. Um, we make a product called MariaDB, uh, but that's not um, what this talk is about. MariaDB, just to be brief, is an enhanced drop-in replacement for MySQL. Um, we'll be having a boff later on this evening, uh, 7.30 in the HP room, um, where we will uh, be, me and a few of the people from SkySQL will be there can answer all your questions about MariaDB if you have any. Um, this talk is, well, let's start with an open source, open source project. Open source begins and for some people ends with the source code, right? Um, and the output of this source code when you run it through a compiler is you either end up with a uh, binary that you then tar up and you can distribute that or you end up with a package, uh, RPM package, a Debian package, whatever. Um, and so at some point you have to go from the source code to the package and that's what this talk is about. Um, so that begs the question, why do we even bother with packages at all? Why can't you just take the source code hard up into a tarball and stamp done on it and call it a day. Well, there's, there are always going to be some people out there who don't mind compiling everything. Um, but for many people, um, they either don't know how to compile the software themselves or they just don't have the time. Um, I, I have happily compiled many pieces of software in my day, but for day-to-day -day use, a lot, m many times I just don't want to bother. Um, I'd rather get the package from the developer and install it, install that. Um, so for the MariaDB project, we try to provide packages for as many projects as we can without, um, you know, going overboard. I mean, we have a finite amount of resources, right? So we, for as many pack, for as many different operating systems, many dist distributions as we can, we try to provide packages, as many as we can realistically do. Um, so the centerpiece of our uh, uh, build and test system is a product called BuildBot. Um, we use that to automate our MariaDB uh, build, test, uh, repeat cycle. Um, oh. What BuildBot does is BuildBot watches, oh, you can find out more about BuildBot at their website. Um, I'm not a BuildBot guru by any stretch, um, so you can find out more about BuildBot itself and um, the details about how to configure it for your own projects um, there. So what BuildBot does is it watches various trees. Um, we use, um, Marie, the MariaDB project uses Launchpad and when I say BuildBot watches the various trees, what that is, is we have a special MariaDB BuildBot user um, on Launchpad, and that MariaDB BuildBot user is subscribed on Launchpad to those trees, and every time a developer pushes into one of those trees, um, an email gets sent, and then BuildBot is just watching that incoming emails. It sees the email, and it knows, okay, we're for one of the 51, 52, 53, 55 trees. Those are our standard trees. And then it's also watching various developer trees. Um, the 55 Serg tree belongs to Sergey Golubchik, who's one of our primary developers. There's, there's a bunch of others that it watches. And um, when, it's, when it sees an update, um, uh, it'll, it'll, the email will come in. It'll see, hey, there's, there's, someone's pushed into, say, the 55 tree. And so then what, what it does, um, BuildBot has a client-server architecture, so 
or master-slave architecture. That's not as politically correct as it once was. But there's, there's a bunch of build slaves, and then there's the build bot master. And so the build bot master says, OK, you need to build this. Here's what you need to build. And then, um, and then out comes the packages. This is kind of a high level overview of it. Um, for these build slaves, we have a lot of them. Um, some of them are going to be physical boxes. Um, things like for our Windows builds, that's a physical server. Uh, for our Solaris builds, that's a physical server. Um, for our Mac OS builds, that's of course a physical server. Um, but we have a lot more virtual servers, um, uh, especially for all of our Linux builds. Uh, the virtual uh, solution that we, that we use is KVM, and we use a um, wrapper around that. Uh, we, we call it run VM, um, which BuildBot basically sends a command to run VM. Run VM handles spinning up the VM, sending the VM the commands, pulling out the, the output, the package, or the, the binary, whatever, what have you. Um, run VM is um, open source. Uh, we've released it under the GPL. It's in our MariaDB tools uh, project on Launchpad. It is. Um, I, I find it very handy. Um, it automates a lot of the, the drudgery of trying to, to manage all the VMs. Um, so th basically what's happening with when BuildBot and RunVM are interacting with these VMs is, is taking the tarball, um, the source tarball that you export from Bazaar, uh, the source, uh, conf source code management system that we use, uh, it takes that tarball and it spins up, a, spins up a build VM. That build VM then creates the package. Um, it could be a Debian package. It could be a Red Hat package, what have you. Um, and then what, what BuildBot will do is it will take those packages. It'll, take, it'll copy, copy the source in to the VM, copy the result out of the VM, the package file, and then it'll spin up new VMs. Um, we have VMs that are configured uh, like, say, a base install of um, Ubuntu 12.04. Uh, it'll spin up that. It'll copy the packages in, and it'll test installing MariaDB on a base install of Ubuntu. And then it'll have another VM that has MySQL installed, and it'll do, this, do that. It'll have a VM that has MariaDB installed, and it'll test upgrading. Um, just all sorts of different VMs in different configurations. Um, it'll spin those up, it'll test, and basically it'll, you'll either come back it succeeded or you'll come back it failed. Um, we also run the entire MySQL test suite, which runs all sorts of various queries. Um, every time there's a bug reported, we write a, we write a, a test for that bug uh, that can reliably trigger the bug so that we make sure that you know, when the bug's fixed, the test will pass, and then also for any subsequent pushes, you know, we, we, can, we can find regressions very quickly. Um, uh, the goal is to make sure that, you know, we want it, we want it to be completely bug-free. Um, even, we even spent a good amount of time in, um, when we were first, um, prior to our first release of MariaDB, getting rid of a lot of warnings. Uh, we, we, we haven't eliminated all the warnings, but we considered, you know, if it's warning us about something, then, you know, likely there's something that's it's not quite right, so we want to fix that too. So we, we, we try to spend a lot of time making sure that, every, you know, we want all the tests to pass. Not, you know, we don't want, you know, oh, this test is failing, but it's okay. No, that's not okay. There's a reason the test exists. You know, I mean, sure, there could be a test that's wrong. Well, then you fix the test, you know and you want to get all the tests to pass. And so BuildBot helps us automate that cycle. Um, uh, build, our BuildBot um, is available, uh, publicly accessible um, URL. Uh, it's one of these things where, sure, we could put it behind a firewall or something, but that's more work than just putting it up. Um, our developers need to access this so that they can um, debug things when, when something fails, so anyone can look at it if they want. Um, I mean, a lot of the information is going to be boring, especially when you know, everything's hunky-dory, uh, but uh, 
there was just no sense in, in hiding it. Um, oh, now one thing that you can do, um, we don't believe in secret sauce in open source. You know, there shouldn't be something magical that happens. It's just like, well, we do this, and we do this, and we do this, and that's all open. Then we do this little magical bit, and here's your product. We don't believe in that. In fact, in BuildBot, you can click on any of these, and so say I click on one of these. This is the uh, builder that's building for Debian. I know it's a Debian package. It's Ubuntu precise. It's on AMD 64 architecture. Um, it's building the 5.5 tree. Um, and there was, a, there was a compile warning when it did the make deb step. I don't know if you can read that or not. Uh, that compile warning, you can go in, you can click on that first link underneath that, and you can see every single command that it got sent, including the KVM command that spun up the VM. You can see everything, you know, that it untarred the package, it CD'd into the, into the untarred directory, it, it ran this auto-baked Debian SH script. It, you know, you can see everything that it did. There's no, if you want to completely replicate how we build our packages, it's all there. Um, very easy, you know, very easy to get to, well, somewhat easy to get to, uh, but definitely not hidden. Um, So anyway, going back to the going back to the web interface, we 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 run this cycle continuously. It runs for every single push. Um, every time a developer does a commit and pushes it up to Launchpad, Buildbot gets the email and fires it fires it off and does does the builds. Um, naturally, whenever we comes time for a release, we want to um, make sure that everything is green. Do you have a question? I do. When the developer checks something and it's the one of your. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, even on a bunch of there's an IOS going on. Yep. How do you decide how far to take that build box to allow it to be on chat? You mean how many distros to use? Do you do a six at once or so? Mm-hmm. For one developer checking? Mm-hmm. So so literally there is everything goes everywhere. Yep. Basically basically the, the build build bot's always running. Always running. We have we have um, for the VMs we have two VM machines, uh, VM hosts. We're we're gonna we're gonna add a third, um, and basically all those VM hosts are doing is just it, it'll spin up. It can spin up probably seven or eight VMs simultaneously, and so it'll spin it'll spin all those up with various things. You know, it's it's parsing out the buildbots handling all that. You know, when when does it spin things up and when does it take things down? Um, but it, it handles, okay, we run through, we have a list of builders, and you can see we have, we have a bunch of Debian builders, a bunch of Ubuntu builders, we have some Fedora builders, which, uh, CentOS, Fedora, that's really hard to read, but they were failing there. All of our RPM builders were failing. Uh, this RPM builder wasn't, and then some other, other various ones. So um, we try to have as many um, Ubuntu builders as Ubuntu has supported versions. You know, so when, 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 when something in Ubuntu goes, you know, stops getting security updates, then we'll consider taking that one down. And do you actually build in a package on that specific platform? Mm -hmm. So your, your Ubuntu 11.04 is built in package? It's built and packaged on an Ubuntu 11.04 VM. Okay. So, so we, we, you know, like I said, we try to do as many as we can. Ubuntu was easy because we had, we had, a, we had a few guys who were very familiar with Debian packages, um, and so they, they did the work to, to get it all, get, you know, how we're going to do it set up. And then um, I've, I'm kind of in charge now of whenever a new Ubuntu version comes out, I build a VM, and then I take that VM and I um, make deltas off of that VM. Uh, you know, I have a base VM, and then I make a delta off of that for the install test. I make a delta off of that, install all the build tools, that's our build VM. Then I make a delta off of that, install MySQL, that's our MySQL test VM, and so on. You know, and they're all, they're all set up so that BuildBot can seamlessly SSH into them, SCP stuff in and out, that sort of thing. So, um, when we do a release, 
Um, we want, we want, BuildBot has to be green. I mean, that's, that's not the only criteria for release, of course. You have various goals. You'll have a list of bullet points. You know, you say, well, this 5.5 release, we're, we're putting in this new optimization for subqueries, and we're, we're going to improve this um, something or other. And, you know, we'll have, a, we'll have our to-do list for the release. And so they have the to-do list for the release, and then you also have build, what BuildBot is saying for our test suite. And so basically, over time, those will come together. You know, the to-do list will be done, and then if BuildBot isn't green when the to-do list is done, then, you know, you, you're fixing some bugs until BuildBot is also green. And then when both of them are meet, then it's like, okay, BuildBot's green, BuildBot's green, and the to-do list is done, so now we can release MariaDB 5.5.24. We're ready to go. Woohoo! So that's, that's kind of how we determine, okay, now we're ready to do, to do a release. So at this point, we've got a bunch of files out there. We have, um, we have binary tarballs. We have a source tarball. We have um, a Windows installer package, a Windows zip file. We have a... Um, Solaris tarballs, we have a BSD tarball, we have a whole bunch of Debian and Ubuntu packages, and we have a whole bunch of Red Hat packages. Um, so the next step that we do, it's like, okay, we got the packages, BuildBot's green, we have all of our to-do list checked off, so now we need to get into the hands of users. Um, all of our build, well, our VM build machines are located in Finland, um, in Monty's basement, uh, Monty Wedenius. Um, he's got a, it's a really good, internet connection for, you know, especially from U.S. standards, but it would totally fall over if a thousand people decided to click on a download link at once. That just wouldn't work. So we use mirrors like many distributions. So our primary mirror is the open source development lab um, at the Oregon State University. Go Beavers. Um, they, they are, they're our primary mirror. So I upload, so starting, starting with the binary tarballs, the source tarballs, anything that doesn't need a repository, I upload those to the open source development lab and then um, all of our other mirrors use rsync to pull from there because even though the, the, the number of mirrors isn't as many as the number of users by a long shot, um, even just the mirrors pulling from our primary build system can bring Monty's connection to its knees. Um, because all of our mirrors, of course, run nice big fat pipes and they try to pull really fast. Well, OSU, uh, the o open source lab there, has a nice big fat, you know, education size pipe. And so from there, it uses rsync to rsync it out to, to all of our mirrors. Now, one note about this map I wish this map was inaccurate, but it's actually quite accurate. We have one active. MariaDB mirror in the US, and we have a whole bunch in Europe, and then we have one in Japan and one in Australia. Um, there's actually more, there's actually a few more mirrors in Europe than are shown on the map. But yeah, there's only one in the US, so you have to get some big institutions in the US to step up. Um, so anyway, that gets pushed out to the mirrors, and um, from there, those, those files then, you know, become become available. Uh, so what about the other packages? Um, uh, those packages, as, many, as probably all of you know, are not equal to repositories. Um, you have dependency resolution, all sorts of things that go into making a repository, which makes it, for many people, better than just a binary file that you untar and then run. Um, you, want, you want a startup script, uh, you want a um, dependency resolution, you want to make sure you're pulling in all the dependence, the other libraries that you need, things like that. And so for many people, they want, they want these repositories. Well, to create the repositories, we use a script. Um, the script handles, um, there's, there's nothing fancy in these scripts. They use the system's tools to create the scripts. There's a, the Debian has, their, has a script that creates repositories for apt. Red Hat has a script that creates repositories for yum. Um, we use those um, with a few extra things. I mean, the scripts are nothing special, but just like our run VM script, we, I, we stuck them all into our MariaDB tools. 
uh, project on Launchpad, just in case anyone wants to look at them, if everyone's interested in creating a re repository. This is, those are the scripts we use to create our repositories are there. Um, so you can use them. Um, the scripts also handle um, signing all of the packages. Uh, for the, uh, what do you call it, the, um, the binary tarballs, the single files, uh, distributions of MariaDB, the Windows, the Mac, the Solaris, all those, we, we provide checksums. Uh, but for repositories, they use GPG. And so for those of you who are interested, the scripts handle that. And for those of you who are interested, here's our GPG ID uh, and the short form, which is easier to write down but not as secure. And then the full fingerprint, just in case anyone's GP likes their GPG keys. Um, and so we create those folders. Those folders get uploaded and then mirrored. And then on our um, download site, we have a repository configurator, which um, just basically you, you choose you know, what distribution, what architecture, and it'll spit out the text that you need to add to apt or to yum. Um, you know, in the yum repos.d or your, et or your etsy apt sources.list.d. Uh, file. So, so now, yes. For the repositories, we don't. When, on our downloads page, when you click on a download link for like the tar, the source tarball and the binary tarball, we do um, collect those. I'm trying to think where. They're publicly available. I don't know if we have those download statistics publicly available. But the repos, we don't get. And the repos, we don't get anything from them. Um, so you really have no visibility into distros? And yeah, especially once, once someone, we, we can tell when someone has used our repository configurator to generate a sources.list entry. But after that, we have no way of knowing. Because the, the, um, the, Mirrors, they, you know, we don't have any access to their statistics. So is the way you know that you've discontinued something, you can start complaining? <laughs> um, I don't know. We've never had a complaint. Like when we dropped the, um, like a bunch of yeah, when, when we, we still do Hardy. We still do Hardy. Um, but like the one that came after Hardy, Intrepid, we don't do anymore. And at least I don't know of any complaints. So, because I, I guess with, with those type of distributions, the Ubuntu's especially, people are very quick to upgrade. So, so in fact, the, the main complaints that we got just a few months back was when we didn't have precise repos up as soon as precise was available. And one other question. Mm -hmm. You are kind of in a unique position in that you, your uh, MySQL replacement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I package it as mine, mm -hmm. whereas this, do your packages um, take out MySQL? Do they sit alongside MySQL? They are configured to act as an upgrade. Okay. So the, the way, the way, the, the way in, in the dependency resolution, we consider ourselves an upgrade, which causes its own set of problems. Because uh, I'm familiar with Ubuntu especially. In Ubuntu, there are some packages that rely on the specific version that's packaged in Ubuntu. Not this specific version or greater, it's this specific version. And for those, it's, you know, there's nothing we can do. Yeah, apart from, you know, we, we, we do a couple hackish things in our repositories to try to get around that, but I've heard that even that isn't 100% successful 100% of the time. Um, Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Yep. You you would start it the same way. All of the all of the command line tools are named the same. Yeah. into that on Ubuntu when there was a, 
there was a there was a bug that we fixed and we gave the patch to Oracle and then they patched theirs and then Ubuntu came out with a version they incremented their number and we hadn't incremented our number we came out with our patch and MariaDB was upgraded and, and you know protected against this bug but then they came out and they incremented their number to be one greater it was our 5.1 package and so our our 5.1.63 package Ubuntu wanted to replace it with MySQL 5.1.64. And so we try to minimize that sort of thing. Um, so we, we, we quickly released a 5.1.64 that's fixed that. Um, we incremented our number, basically all we did, because we'd already fixed it. But we incremented our number um, so, that it, so that that went away. But anyone who was running MariaDB 5.2 or 5.3 didn't run into that, because it was, the number was higher. But yes, that, that's something we try to, it's just something we have to deal with because we, we, we are a replacement. So it's, there, there's, I don't think there's an easy answer to get around it. So we just, we just kind of, well, that's one of the things that we're, that we're doing with the next version of MySQL, um, well, next version of MariaDB, because Maria, the next version of MySQL will be MySQL 5.6, right? But MySQL 5.6 isn't out. I don't know when it'll be out, and we have features now that developers are working on that will be done probably long before MySQL 5.6 comes out. And so for our next major release of MariaDB, we can't call it MariaDB 5.6 because that would cause all sorts of problems when MySQL 5.6 comes out. So we're on MariaDB 5.5. .5, so we're, we're trying to come up with some sort of numbering scheme where, yes, we're based on Mar MySQL 5.5.24, but, you know, and that, then we have MariaDB 5.5.24, but we want to add new stuff before MySQL comes out with either a MySQL 5.5.25 or a, a MySQL 5.6. And so we're, 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 we're running into the issue where we, we have to come up with a divergent numbering scheme, and so there's, we're, we're trying to discuss that with some of the core contribut contributors and people who are interested. Um, trying to come up with something that works, maybe a maybe a 5.5.24 dash something, I don't know, you know, or just something completely different. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what we are, work, we're working with like people like Ubuntu on that, trying to especially get away from their hard coding a specific version into their requirements and, and doing it more like they do with things like text editor or web server, you know, do, do the same thing, you know, database, you know or MySQL-like database, or something like that, I don't know. So yeah, yeah, that's something that we're dealing with and developers are working hard on it, trying to come up with something that, that works for everybody. Because um, even, even things like third-party tools, like, like a, a, a GUI client, um, that has to use, um, they'll, they'll enable certain features based on the, the version of MySQL that they detect or the version of MariaDB that they detect. And so we want to make sure that they can detect the correct version so that you know, the version that has um, the subquery optimization that has these extra flags that their GUI client supports that when it detects it. So it has to have a way to detect it. So yeah, the whole version numbering thing, I'm glad I'm not involved in the discussion because it's a big fat mess. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think there's any easy answers for how to get around it, especially since we're kind of you know, we're, we're, we're a replacement. We don't, we don't want to completely fork. I mean, that, we've always resisted that because we don't want to just completely diverge. It may, there may come a point where we'll have to because there's no other way around it, but as, as long as we can, we want to maintain it so that either one, you know, you can just drop in MariaDB and it just replaces it out of the box. We want to maintain that compatibility as long as we can, and so solving this is one thing that we have to do, but someone else has to do it. Not me. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Looking at my notes. 
Okay, so once we're at this point in the release process, by the way, this release process that I'm talking about is all on our knowledge base. Um, I'll give you a link to the knowledge base, and if you go to the knowledge base um, and search for release process, you'll get this, and it lists everything that I do. I actually follow it from top to bottom every time we do a release, and that's what this talk is, is taken from, um, down to the commands that I use to pull out things like the change log, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, so anyway, at this point, we've got our repositories mirrored, We've got our, um, the, the binary files mirrored. Um, so are, are we, if we've got them, when the, when the files are mirrored, we put them into our download system. So at our, at our download system, we can track downloads and we, and we try to. Um, and there's even one of those annoying surveys that you can either fill out or click no thanks on. You know, our marketing guys wanted one of those. Um, but so they're in the download system, so all ready to go. Are we ready to release? No, we still have to do documentation. Um, there's a lot of little things that you have to do when you're trying to coordinate a release. Um, hopefully, most of the documentation will have already been written because the developers are supposed to do that and we asked them nicely six months ago to document the feature that they were coding. You know, it's like you're adding, you're adding new, new, command, new um, options to create table. We, we need to know what those are. And we try, to, we try to keep out in front of the release and document them with a nice little banner saying this feature is, is unreleased yet, but it will be. Um, but sometimes things slip through and some developer will come to me on the day of the release and say, oh, we haven't documented this. We don't have any documentation on it. And then I'll say, well, you know, where, do, where can I find this stuff? And he'll go, oh, well, here, I'll send you something, you know, and then I'll quick write up something so we have something and we'll expand upon it later. But there, there's always, there's always going to be a lot of little things even if it's just going through our knowledge base and removing all those little banners because it's released now. Um, there's also the release notes, which has kind of a summary of the release that has to be written. Um, and then there's the change log. The change log is, is, is a bigger thing. Um, the raw change log, you can export directly from Bazaar, um, and it looks kind of like this. Um, it's, it's basically a record. It has every single release, every, every single push into the tree and it, it says who, who pushed it in, what time they pushed it in, what branch they pushed it into, and then the message. That's the important bit that says what they did. Now, of course, some developers are better at others at writing their messages. Um, but this, this, this is very useful information, and this is probably the way that the developers like to look at it because they're just using bazaar on the command line, and they say, well, okay, what was in this release? And they do their little magic bazaar string, and it spits out what they want to know. But for regular users, it's not the most user-friendly. Um, so one of the things that, that I do for each release is I take this raw change log, I export it, I export all of the pushes between the previous release and this new release, and then I format it so that it looks something like this. Um, the, the main thing I add is I add links to everything. Um, so the revision links to Launchpad. So you can click on that, you can go to Launchpad, you can see that push, you can see which files were changed, you can see what code was changed on a line-by-line -line basis. Um, you can also see when there's bugs that were fixed. Um, you can see the bug, um, you can click on the bug, you can see the bug report, um, see the, the test case, whatever um, that, that was in there. So just make it a little bit more user-friendly. We stick that in our knowledge base so that those who are interested, and I mean, a lot of people aren't interested at all in the change log, but for those that, that want to see, you know, I, this bug, I, was, I want to see what they did to fix this bug, if you're interested. So this, this is a quick way to get to it um, through the change log. So that, that's another big thing that we do as part of the release. So eventually, you're going to get to the point where you can actually do the release. You have the files, you have the repositories, everything's mirrored, you have your documentation all updated, and then you can release. And so the, 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 I guess the final step in our release process is we um, send an email. That's basically the release. And that, that we, at, we have an announce mailing list at mariadb.org. Um, you can sign up for it there. It's just, just for announcements, just release announcements. Um, and so that's, that's basically when I consider the release done or happening. Um, of course, there's always going to be a few niggly things like doing some blog posts about the release or posting on Google Plus and Facebook and Twitter. But um, at, this, at this point, when I send out the email, that's when I, okay, okay, this release is done. I can finally go to bed. It's one in the morning. We're, we're through here. Um, 
So here's some links. We have MariaDB.org, of course. That's, that's the primary landing page. Uh, it has links to the downloads, to the knowledge base, um, various other things. Um, our knowledge base itself is at kb.askmonty.org. Um, Ask Monty is, you know, for Monty with Ennius, the CEO of Monty Program, co-creator of MySQL and creator of MariaDB. Um, so kb.askmonty.org, that's our knowledge base. That's where we stick all of our documentation and everything else. Um, we have a few ma mailing lists that some of you may be interested in. Um, they're at Launchpad. Uh, Launchpad.net slash tilde Maria Discuss is the main one for users of MariaDB. If you replace the Discuss with developers, that's the main developer mailing list. If you want to get a hold of the developers, um, that's probably one of the better ways. The other way is through um, IRC on Freenode. Uh, it's Pound Maria. Um, that's, uh, that's our IRC channel. And then, of course, we have, you know, we're social media fight, I guess. Um, we have our uh, MariaDB pages on Twitter and Facebook and Google+. So, anyway, any questions? Um, I've been with them for a couple years. One thing that strikes me is that the, the knowledge base is sort of as opposed to, there's no PDF as far as I can Yeah, there's no, there's no PDF manual. And reasoning, which is in some ways it's interesting in both dynamic and both current events. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wasn't part of the decision to go to, to, to use a knowledge base instead of like, like say doing everything in DocBook and exporting it to different formats. I wasn't involved in that process. Um, I, think, I think it's like you said, they wanted something or Monty and some of the other developers wanted something that was um, always up to date where you could ask questions. Um, get answers where um, it was a somewhat wiki-like, where you could, you know, people could, any, anyone with an account can, can go in and, and fix typos or add new content if they want. Um, I think part of that decision, too, though, is, uh, is you have a usability question, so there might be rules to set. <laughs> the, the SQL is following their team. Yeah. It's their partner, so mm -hmm. I think you, you get into that one big fat point. <laughs> Yeah, 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 and, and, and a anything that's not in the knowledge base, yeah, we, ought, we will just say, you know, the, it's in the manual. Um, the manual is one thing. We would love to have the entire MySQL manual, but that is one part of MySQL that's never been open source. It's, it's always been copyright MySQL AB, copyright Sun, copyright Oracle. So we, there, there's no way that we can use the manual, and we don't have the resources to lock someone in a room and completely rewrite the manual. So, so it's basically the knowledge, in the knowledge base, we primarily document the changes. And we, 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 if, we're, if we document, say, changes to alter table, we'll often go in and put in all the options to alter table anyway. You know, so slowly over time, hopefully it'll be a complete replacement, but it's not at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's hard to tell because there's always going to be several trees being built at the same time. But for any individual one, you're looking at a few hours. Um, it's just, you know, they'll, they'll push into. A lot of times what happens is the bug exists, say, in 5.2, and they'll fix the bug in 5.2. Then immediately after that, they'll merge the 5.2 fix into 5.3, and they'll merge the 5.3 fix into 5.5. So it kind of cascades up the tree. And so then all of those builds are happening kind of you know, simultaneously. And BuildBot manages, it, just, it looks at the load averages on the two um, VMs, and it um, will spin up, you know, there's a certain number that it can run simultaneously, and it has a list of every, everything that still needs to be done, every build slave that needs to, needs to build this, these changes, and it just keeps a queue, and it just keeps, you know, going through the queue one after another. Are there some methodologies that, you know, say I kept something in and started going 
Well, if you see on, mm -mm. not necessarily. If you go, let's see where. Oh, here it is. Um, if you notice these white spaces, that that was a developer canceling it. So the developer basically go in. We have um, the build system. You can the the publicly accessible is read only, for natural reasons because we don't want some punk coming in and pressing rebuild on everything. Because, uh, but the developers can go in, they can, they can restart a build, they can cancel a build. So, so in this case, they were doing a lot of changes to the Red Hat packages to get them to work. So, so they made a change, that was here. And then they were like, oh, that doesn't fix it. So they did another one and they, you know, it, it had already built these ones by the time they noticed it. It had already built and tested these ones or already started them, so it went ahead and completed them. But then it's then they're like, oh, no, that's not it. And so then they went and did this. Now, this was going to be the release until our um, Windows guy came back and said, oh, you know, we still need this. And then um, our, our release, our, we, have, we, always, we always designate a coordinator for our major releases. The release coordinator gave him a big hard time. It's like, well, why didn't you tell anybody, you know, blah, 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 ninth hour, all that. So, so, then, so then they had this push, and then there was, there was some other little niggly thing that they caught, and so then they, then, so then they canceled this, and then they did the final. Each column is a, is, is a push. So, so this is three, I uh, can't even hardly read that, three, four, three, one, or something like that, and it goes, you know, it just keeps going up. So yeah, the developers on, on, on the back side can go in and they can, they can totally control what BuildBot's doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can see everything in, in one big, huge list, but that's really confusing to look at because you, you have to pay attention to which branch and which tree. So this is, this is a grid view just for the 5.5 branch. So you can, you can view it by branch, you can view it by, you know, you can view all the ones that just build packages, you can just build all the ones that are just testing, you can split things out. I have no idea. Yeah, it, that's probably why they did it because the develop whoever the the guy who implemented our buildbot system. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's actually he's actually building a house um, in um, near. Uh, he he lives outside of Helsinki now, but he's building one closer to the city. And he's specially building a server room in the middle that is going to heat the house. <laughs> so he's at, he's at, I think I think he said he's going to put his like his sauna on top of it and heat the sauna using the excess waste heat from the builds. Yeah, because yeah, his basement just has all these servers in it, and yeah, we we give him a hard time about it because he, he won't move them anywhere else because he, he wants to have them right there because he likes them right there. And it's just like, uh, oh well. Our web servers, our email servers, we're, they're, they're, they're at a regular hosting facility. <laughs> because the, uh, the developers got mad about, you know, what BuildBot, you know, would, or there'd be a power outage or, or BuildBot would be taking all the resources or there'd be a release and all the, down anyway, so. It was just, you know, we have, there's a few things we need to have, and they need to be outside of your, <laughs> of your house. This, actually, when you go to buildbot.asmondi.org, that is a server at his house. So, because that, that's where the server's running. That server is basically dedicated to buildbot. It used to have a few other things running on it, but it's basically been pared down to just running buildbot. Because with all the builds that we do, um, it, it's, that's, that's enough for that server. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you.
cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale number two it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks.
The gym has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.